ever had one of those weeks, one of those weeks where at the end of it, you just feel drained, tired, and ready to relax? So maybe you come home, you pour yourself a cold drink, and you're ready to go sit outside on the patio and enjoy the beautiful sunset. So you go outside and you're just starting to settle in and relax when you realize you're not alone. The first one strikes. Oh yeah, you guessed it, it's a mosquito. Yeah, they're annoying, they cause a lot of itchiness, they're bothersome, and they can ruin your evening outside. But as an infectious disease epidemiologist, they're more than just a nuisance to me. Half of the world's population is at risk for vector-borne and mosquito-borne illnesses. One billion people each year are infected. And up to one million people die. So now, we live in Arizona. There aren't as many mosquitoes as there are other places, but now picture this, you've gotten a whole two weeks off. It's time to go have a vacation, and you're going to Rio. That sounds like a fun place to go. Walk the streets, enjoy some music, some food, and oh yeah, you might get bitten by a mosquito in Brazil, too. In Brazil, there's a lot higher risk of mosquito-borne diseases. So you might think, well, yeah, maybe I go to Brazil and I get sick, but that's unlikely to have an effect here. But what you got to remember is that something like Zika can have such devastating consequences. On one side, you see a child with a normal-sized head. If you remember, Zika is that virus that can lead to those devastating health consequences. On the other side, you see a child born with microcephaly, one of the most severe consequences of a Zika infection in a pregnant woman. Now, I don't know about you, but going from that happy, excited moment of having your first child to delivering it and seeing a baby with this kind of consequence, that would be so devastating. I don't want that to be anyone. I don't want that to be one of my three daughters. And even though it seems like these things are half a globe away, it takes less than 24 hours for any of these diseases to come into our home area. And we already do have the mosquitoes here that transmit Zika. They're called Aedes aegypti. They're one of the most difficult mosquitoes to control. They're the ones that when you are out on your patio, you're slapping at your ankles, and they seem to fly so fast you can't quite get them. Yeah, that's the one. And they transmit a lot of other diseases than Zika. They transmit dengue, chikungunya, miaro, yellow fever. I have a story about chikungunya. A friend of mine in Jamaica, when I visited her, she said, Casey, oh, I had chikungunya. And she said, my hands hurt so badly I couldn't open a doorknob. Couldn't open a doorknob for two weeks. And it took months before her arthritis resolved from the disease. And we already have some mosquito-borne illnesses here. We have West Nile virus. West Nile virus killed eight people in Arizona just last year. And things are changing. Those may seem like fairly low numbers to you, and by comparison to a lot of places in the world, they are. What you see here is the global temperatures in 1884, compared to the global temperatures between a standard of 1951 and 1980. Fast forward to 2016. This is what it looks like now. Climate change is happening, and it's making our planet warmer. So what does that have to do with mosquito-borne illnesses? Actually, a lot. So mosquitoes' habitats are based upon the temperature conditions that are there. So they can go a little bit more northward, and they can be more. 
So that time frame between egg and adult gets shorter when the temperatures are higher. And that means those cycles of mosquito development can go faster and faster, leading to more mosquitoes in the environment. And it's not just the mosquito, it's the virus too. So you may think that if you came home sick from Brazil and you were sitting on your patio trying to recover, and a mosquito bit you and flew across the room and bit your daughter, that they might get infected. But that's not how it works. A mosquito gets the virus, and it has to go through a development stage within the mosquito before it can transmit to the next person. And guess what? That time that it takes for that virus to develop gets shorter as temperatures get warmer. Exactly. So it's not just increasing temperatures that's going to go along with climate change. It's changes in our weather patterns. Increasing extreme weather events. That means hurricanes, like Hurricane Katrina depicted here. That means more droughts. And it also means more severe cold weather like they're experiencing on the East Coast. Cold weather does not mean climate change isn't happening. I think it's really time that we stop asking people, do you believe in climate change? And start asking them, do you understand it? So these extreme weather events are going to do a couple of things. First, they're going to make people miserable, but second, they can destroy the infrastructure. They can make it harder to get resources to people who need it. They cost a lot of money. And the last thing you need after a devastating hurricane or other event is for another disaster to occur, a pandemic. Now, the evidence is sort of equivocal as to whether or not hurricanes directly lead to increased mosquito-borne diseases. However, when you damage infrastructure, that can take a long time to rebuild. And that damaged infrastructure can lead to more vulnerability for people. So one of the things that I think is really important is to share information, for people to know what's happening in their community and how to prevent disease spread. Knowledge equals power. So how do we get that knowledge traditionally? Well, traditionally, as you come home from Brazil, maybe you have dengue and you're feeling kind of sick. Some people may just stay at home. They might write it out at home and never see a medical professional. Some people will go to the doctor. And when they go to the doctor, they talk to the doctor, tell them their symptoms, and maybe the doctor recognizes that this might be dengue or chikungunya or Zika, and they go ahead and they get them a lab test. And it gets tested in the lab, and those results get conveyed to somebody at the health department. They process the data, and it goes out to the community. That takes a long time. It can take a long time because the health department isn't going to publish or make information available on those cases that are uh, suspect. They want to be sure that there's something going on. So that means there's delays, and it's a tip of an iceberg. Because you can see people are getting lost along this process, right? Because somebody may just stay home. Somebody may go to a doctor who doesn't know that dengue could be a possibility. So I've been working with public health researchers, because this is a really well-established fact in the public health community, and we've been trying to figure out another way to get information to people. And so we cut out the doctors, the lab, and even the health department, and we're asking people to tell each other directly what's happening in their community to tell us, are you sick? Are you feeling poorly? Is there something going on? Now, that information in and of itself, mm, it's a little suspect, right? Because people could have lots of things if they have a fever. But if you see 10, 12, 15 people in an area that have this condition, that's going to peak public health. That's going to have them say, OK, let's investigate. Let's see what's going on. And it gives you direct information at an early time so that you might be able to take action. And in this, we have developed an application called Kadenga. It's kind of a funny word, but it's actually a Swahili word for chikungunya. 
And in this application, we give you both user-generated data so you can see what's happening in and around your zip code. Are there people who are sick? What do they have from a syndromic standpoint, right? Not dengue specifically, but something that might look like dengue. And then we also give you, coupled with that, the more certain information, the information that's coming from the health departments that tells you, yes, there is a case of dengue there. But we don't just tell you what's happening in the community, we tell you what can you do to stop it. We feel that giving people back information gives them that ability to take action and do something for themselves, to protect themselves, to protect their family members. And so we tell you a lot of things about mosquitoes. Do you know where all the places are in your home and in your yard where a mosquito can lay its eggs and breed? Did you know that a mosquito, if you go away for three or four weeks, could lay its eggs in your toilet? That's not a very nice surprise to come home to. A bite like that, nobody really wants that to happen. Another really critical piece of information that I found in a survey that we did with Arizona residents that people really didn't know is that Zika is also sexually transmitted, the first mosquito-borne disease to also be transmitted through that route. Really important information for pregnant women and wanting, those that are wanting to become pregnant. So we share all of this information to empower people to act. And we were really excited because we launched this right after the Zika pandemic kind of hit the United States. And people were interested, people downloaded it, people used it, we were really excited. And then guess what happened? The Zika pandemic faded from the news cycle. And so I was kind of devastated. We'd spent all of this time and energy working on this system, and I'm like, oh, man, have we failed? Have we flopped? So then we did another survey here in Arizona, and we were asking people, when would you be more likely to actually take action to prevent mosquito-borne disease and mosquito bites? And they gave me a very revealing answer. They said, well, I'm more likely to do it when it's more likely to affect me. You can see here that as you get closer and closer to where people live, they are much more likely to say, I'm going to take action. So we want to leverage that. We're going back to the drawing board. We're working with communities. We're working with public health partners. And we're trying to identify those critical time points when people really need to give us their input, when we really need you to tell us if you're home and you're sick, when you really need that critical health information that tells you when you need to take action in your home and your community. So we may be approaching some of you and asking you, what do you want us to tell you? Do you want us to tell you when mosquitoes are high, when there's a disease that's potentially transmitted by mosquitoes just down your street? or in your zip code, we're going to find that out. And when we do, we're going to be able to alert you. So if you have Kadanga on your phone, you might just get a little buzz. And it'll say, high alert. Please take precaution and start telling us if you're ill. And when that happens, when you're going outside, to enjoy that beautiful evening. You might pick up your glass in one hand and a can of mosquito repellent in the other. Thank you. <laughs>